All right, and welcome to Deep Learning with Text. So what I'd like to do before I get started is understand who's in the room. So how many of you have seen some form of neural network before, or at least have a baseline understanding? Awesome, okay, I'm speaking to the right people. Um, how many of you guys have actually did deep learning at your jobs? Okay, there we go. All right, that's, that's more realistic, okay. So what I'm gonna talk about today is some of the more broadly ap applicable things in NLP and deep learning. So most people use deep learning for video, sound, images. That's where you see a lot of the breakthroughs. You don't see text covered very often. Um, so what I'd like to do today is go through a baseline pipeline. So in this case, like sentence segmentation, word usage, and more covering the use cases of, and how, like how you can mix and match the stuff from you know, word vec and some of these other algorithms with other neural networks. So there's gonna be a lot of coverage here at the conference today, primarily focused on, you know, or actually today and Saturday, on just like, what is word vec what's the theory behind it, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm actually gonna cover multiple kinds of neural word embeddings, so there's more than just word vec So I'm gonna make sure that you guys have a broader understanding of what the heck do I do with neural networks and NLP, and what, is, what are some of the algorithms out there? So there's a lot more than just word to vec And there's, there's multiple ways to use these algorithms. So what I'd like to make sure you understand is like, how do I use the features learned from word to vec and these, these word embeddings? And from there, what do I do with them? And, and then what are the possibilities? Okay, so starting off. Uh. There we go. So first of all, so basically like neural word embeddings learn what's called a distribution. They learn word usage. So a word embedding in this case is a matrix. It's a white matrix and it's coefficients. Those coefficients represent word usage, right? So in this case, like a word in, is represented by its neighbors, right? So in this case, if, if I'm trying to learn, let's just say I'm doing a, the named entity recognition task. You know, so I'm trying to recognize an organization. And I have Galvanized University, right? So Galvanized University is, is basically, it's a proper noun. There's university in the name. That's probably an organization. So in this case, the, the neighbor is university. We're gonna see that across multiple organizations. The words are indicative of the actual concept. So if you wanna disambiguate words, you, want, you, use their, you use their context. It's very similar to what you see with, um, hold on. So, ah, uh, damn it, ah, forget it, uh, moving on. <laughs> um, the word senses though, um, the, I'm trying to remember the, the word, WordNet, sorry. So WordNet, you know, you have the word senses, right? So it's a very similar idea. What you can actually do is teach a neural network word senses. So what the, what the vectors represent, if, if, you have a, if you have a vocab, so very, very standard in natural language processing, you have a vocab still, you have, n row, like you have n rows, where n is the number of words in the vocab, and then m is the number of features, right? So m is the number of features you wanna use for whatever task you're trying to do. So I'm gonna make sure to have visualizations for each of these. My goal right now is just kind of a baseline overview, right? So let's, let's start by understanding what word usage is and that kind of stuff. So in this case, what can we do with these word embeddings, right? So basically what we can do is actually, you'll, you'll see that words that are very conceptually similar have what, a high cosine similarity. So if you remember the, the embeddings I mentioned before, if I have two words, right, you know, if I have galvanized and university, they're gonna have a high cosine similarity. So they're gonna, so they're gonna be next to each other conceptually. Because again, word vectors represent context or usage. So what I want to do is, using, using these features, I want to actually replace a lot of the more common tasks that we, typically, that we typically see. So like, you know, I don't want to have to do part of speech tagging. I don't want to have to figure out like suffixes, right? So one of the problems with natural language processing is it's brittle. It's very domain specific. There's a lot of labels. And unsupervised learning has been a huge not trend, right? So there's no, it, it hasn't been done, right? So you can do, you can, you can use TF-IDF, right? But it's a lot harder to do like sequence learning and this other kind of fun stuff because you need to think about, well, what are all the possible usages or contexts? Like, 
suffixes, prefixes, right? You know, there's a lot to think about when you're doing text. And then what about language? So neural word embeddings can learn context. So one great example of this is machine translation. So if I want to map, if I want to map two conceptually similar words, I can use the same pipeline because everything's a vector. And then what you can actually do is you can actually map concepts that are similar in different languages to eat across, like across languages because it's all one mathematical space. So these vectors, again, is an N by M matrix, right? So it's a neural network. So this is, this is more or less word to vec. So it's, more, it's just an autoencoder. So what you do is you train on word usage, right? So if what, you'll, what you do, you have a sliding window of text, you have sentences, right? So you train on individual tokens, and you train on pairwise occurrences of the words. So you basically, you calculate a gradient relative to word usage, and you use that to update the, basically like the, the baseline weight matrix, which is the, 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 the word lookup table, right? So again, it's a, it's a multi-layer neural network. You have, you have the input layer, you have the first layer, which is the, ba the baseline representation you're gonna use. So that's your beginning weights, and then you have the error. So what you do is you backpropagate on word context. So you're gonna see a lot of that throughout, throughout, this presentation, throughout this presentation as well as at this conference. So rather than being redundant, I'm gonna give more of a cursory level overview. And again, like make sure that you guys understand conceptually what's going on. And then I encourage you to attend other talks for a lot more in depth, like the math behind it and some of these other things. So this is a baseline representation. You're actually gonna see this visualization again. So you know, you're, you'll see, you know, autoencoders are common. They're, they're everywhere. But basically, the only, thing, the only other thing you should understand about the word usage and how they're trained is that there's different representations. One of those is continuous bag of words. So what you're doing is you, you, actually train, you actually train on words just next to each other. That's like the more continuous bag of words. Then there's also skipgram. Skipgram is where you actually say, you know, if I have, I want to say, okay, if I have, I am teaching at Dalvinize, I have I, I am, I teaching, at, I, I at, that's a skipgram. So what you're doing is you're interleaving words and you're skipping other, wor other words. And what you can do is you can actually set what's called a window size. And then basically what, what then happens is you train on these embeddings. And these embeddings then represent the word usage in aggregate. So what you're doing is you're doing backpropagation with an algorithm called hierarchical softmax for word to vec. Hierarchical softmax is training on likelihoods of word, pairwise likelihoods, the, wor the likelihoods of words co-occurring with each other. You can also do something called negative sampling. Negative sampling is a way of saying, okay, now I want you to, I want you to learn words that don't come, don't come next to each other. So you want, you, what you want to do, it's, it's almost like a supervised learning task in that you're doing backpropagation, but you're only doing it on the data. So how does that, how does that map back to deep learning? So, Deep learning is known for representation learning. So how many of you guys have seen the filters before, like the, the renders? Yes, no? Okay, all right, that I probably should, um, that I probably, that I will show after this, so you guys can actually get an idea, a better idea of what, what a representation is, and then we'll go from there. So in this case, like, what are the typical, what are the typical techniques? So you, what you can actually do is, you can actually have a one-hot one hot vector, which is, in this case, these words occur, it's binary. You know, the, the appeal with, you know, and th there's a problem there, though. It's sparse, right? When you have sparsity, it's hard to learn, it's hard to learn patterns, and you tend to overfit, right? The, the appeal with the neural word embeddings is that they're dense. So what do, you, so what do I mean by dense? So all continuous data. So there's no, there's no particular feature that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna cause your algorithm to overfit. So you can actually learn patterns more generalizable. And word vec actually has built-in regularization as well. So if you L2 regularize the vectors, you can use those for more or less neutral, neutral concept embeddings. All right, so. All right, so let's go through the traditional pipeline and let's understand baseline natural language processing and then let's understand where, where word vec kind of splits off. So, you have your baseline understanding, right? Which is in this case, I have sentences that I want to learn from. So I, I have sequences, I have sets of text, I have a corpus, and then I want to run a tokenizer. So the tokenizer is where you're, where you're splitting up the text into 
individual words. And then from there, you might want to do sentence segmentation if you're trying to, if you're trying to do some sort of sequence learning. Because like, you don't want to train on a whole corpus, right? Because you can't, you can't really learn long tail trends like that. So you, you split on sentences maybe. And then from there, depending on the task you're doing, you do part of speech tagging. So part of speech tagging, it, for those of you who aren't familiar, is just saying like, this word's an adverb, that one's a proper noun. And then what you typically do is you use those features as a further representation for like more signal. It's a more generalizable signal. So part of speech tagging is a discrete set of tags that you can use. That's pretty useful. Um, so that's the thing. The interesting thing here, though, word of X stops at tokenization. That's it. You do tokenization and you're done. In this case, part of speech tagging is typically used for representations where I want to, if I want to learn what an organization is, or I want to like do noun phrase extraction, I want to pull out names of things. You know, you have a series of you have a series of nouns. You know, and then from there, maybe I'll do constituency parsing. So constituency parsing in this case is just you turn a sentence into a tree. You start with the words at the bottom, and then you have part of speech tags above the words, and then those form phrases. And then you have the stuff at the top. So, like, again, like, that, that gets kind of crazy. Like, that's slow, right? So is actually dependency parsing. So dependency parsing is used in relation extraction. What you're, and, and in this case, like, what you capture is a graph, of the, a graph of the text instead, how the words are interrelated. So rather than relying on part of speech tags, you actually have noun subject. So the labels, the labels in this case are actually relations, like how words are related rather than based on their part of speech tags. So again, that gets kind of crazy. Like why do I wanna, why do I wanna run, why do I wanna, wanna run all these extra features, right? So, you know, and, and uh, in this case, like let's think about how brittle that is. So if I think about noun subject and then I have to think of every possible word that it could occur that's a subject and I'm trying to do like relation extraction, while it is generalizable to a point, like you start, you start to run out of you start to run out of a, a space you can actually use for any sort of pattern recognition. We have to remember that machine learning is all about pattern recognition, right? So you're trying to, you're trying, you as a data scientist are typically specifying three noun phrases in a row, or three nouns in a row are a noun phrase. And then from there I can use that and maybe the fact that this suffix occurred and maybe this prefix occurred, and then that represents an organization, or that represents maybe positive or negative. So sequence learning. So there's two kinds of representations in, in, in NLP. We typically see sequence learners, conditional random fields, and we see bag of words. So bag of words is a more traditional approach. You do tokenization, right? And then you break, you break it, you, you have a vocab, just like the rest, and then you have N by M, where N is the number of documents and M is the number of words. So that breaks down for sequential tasks because you lose context, right? It's a bag, you count. You know, maybe you might do TF-IDF so you get slightly better signal, but at the end of the day, it's still sparse, and it's still, it's still a big matrix. The advantage with, let's just say, neural word embeddings over a bag of words is I can do something like, let's just say I have 100,000 features. I can actually take that and, and mash it down to 300. So what you, uh, one trick you can actually do is you can actually average the word embeddings and use that as an approximation for a document. So let's, let's, so let's walk through that. I have my neural word embeddings an M by M matrix, N is the number, the number of words in the vocab, by let's just say 300. So what I do is I walk through each word in the, in the document, and then I say, okay, give me the vector for that word. Give me the vector for that word. Give me the vector for that word. And then you take the mean. You can actually use that as an approximation for TF-IDF. One of my students actually built a recommender engine based on this. So he used a combination of TF-IDF. So used, he, you know, TF-IDF is still very common. But he also used the, the word embeddings. He, he multiplied the word that occurred by its TF-IDF weight, if, if it had one, and he used that as like a weighted average to actually build a recommender. So the, the unsupervised features actually learn, like again, they learn patterns, and they're actually great at approximating a document. And in this case, the, the, the query document he used was only 300 in length. So rather than, rather than have to store all this, you can actually just do a weighted average and your, you know, your, your space is a lot smaller. You can actually do a lot with the, base, like the baseline vocab. So rather than, rather, than, rather than the sparsity problem you run into, in this case you do dense, you take means, and your, your feature space is a lot smaller. So I just want to make sure that we get like baseline NLP. So again, it stops at tokenization. 
you might do, you, the only other thing you might do is lemmatization or stemming. So you still have the same problems with a vocab though. So if you have your N by M matrix, right, it doesn't matter if it's word to vec or glove as well. So glove is, stands for global vectors. That came out of Stanford, for those of you who have, might not have seen that before. Um, so you still, have, you still have your word embedding, right? So you have N by M. You want to still compress your vocab, right? So you, wanna, you still want your corpus to generalize, right? All right. So TF idea. Let's see. Unigrams, bigrams, trigrams. Okay. So in this case, one other, one other thing I want to mention. With the word embeddings, you can also do phrase embeddings. So if we, now, that, now that we understand a vocab, what you can actually do is you can actually, you can, you can actually have each individual word in your vocab be a trigram or a bi, bigram or a trigram. So in this case, like, those words can actually be phrase embeddings as well. So you can actually teach it short, you can actually teach the word embedding short form text. Kernel hashing, you guys have seen this before. Word to vec. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna skip to use cases now. So let's, 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 let's just get a baseline visualization first. So these are word embeddings. So let's, let's, let's remind ourselves what this vector space is. This vector space is you have your matrix, and you want to run, you want to find like nearest neighbors. So in this case, words that are conceptually near each other have a high cosine similarity. So words that are near each other in this embedding space, this embedding space is called TSNE, T stochastic neighbor embedding. So what it is, is it's basically TSNE is an algorithm for finding the likelihoods of words co occurring with each other or features. So it uses what, what you do is you actually you, you use something called an SP tree or VP tree, a vantage point tree, to actually learn likelihoods of words being next to each other. It's a spatial embedding. And you can use that to build, you can actually use that to build this visualization. So what it does is it finds, it finds, it finds words that should be near each other. So in this case, the representations, there's a few, there's a few, there's a few ways you can learn. So one of the, look, for sequential learning, Sequential learning involves what's called a moving window. So you can, there's a, pap there's a paper you should look up called NLP Almost From Scratch. NLP Almost From Scratch uses a neural network to, to replace every single manual natural language processing task. And it uses these embeddings. So it uses an embedding, and it does back propagation on the labels, and it, uses, it, it just uses those embeddings as features. So how do you do that? So if you want to do named entity recognition, let's just say you break up a sentence and you label in this case, sets of words, and the, or windows, you, you do a moving window over the text, and you say, okay, now, let's just say I want to I have a window size of three, and I say, and I say nitro, nitro PDF documents. That's an organ, maybe that's an organization, or that's a name, right? So what you can do is you can say, give me the words from the vocab. So uh, remember, I've already trained my embeddings, right? So the embeddings just train on word usage. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll look up each word that occurred, and if, if, if it's unknown, it's unknown. So that's another typical trick you do. But either way, you have a window, and you say, okay, now, let me concat these vectors together, right? So in this case, you can take these embeddings and embed them row-wise, right? So let's, let's think about that. So give me the word for nitro, give me the word for PDF, give me the word for document in, in the neural word embedding, right? So you, did, you trained on word usage already, and now I want to do a moving window, and that, that moving window, will, that, that window will have a label, right? So that label is an organization. So what I did was I just generated a feature vector for a sequence. So you can actually use the neural word embeddings for sequence, for sequence learning. So what else can, so you, you typically train this with, with what's called a deep belief network, or another, like any other kind of neural network. It's typically for feed-forward architectures, you do this moving window approach. So you can actually teach a static feed-forward neural network sequences. So in this case, like, why does that work? So the feature space represents usage. So you inject context by concatenating the vectors together. So that will give you, and the, that will give you the features for a supervised task. So rather than doing part of speech tagging for named entity recognition, what you can actually do instead is just use the embeddings. And those embeddings represent a concept space that you can use for supervised learning. So in this case, how else can you, so how else can you do this? You can, also, you, you, can also, you, you can also combine these words with a recursive neural net. 
So a recursive neural net in this case, you build a constituency parser, and then you can actually use that constituency parser to build. So remember, a constituency parser generates a binary tree. And instead, what you can do is, so instead what you can, so I'm, if, by the way, I'm going to give references for all this stuff after. So I'm more going to like answer questions. So if there's any of this, if there's any of this you guys want to see, I have visualizations and all sorts of slides that I'm going to be sending out. Uh, so don't, don't feel like what I'm covering here is like completely like off the cuff. Like I'm giving you guys, I'm giving you guys examples because like I, I'm not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to go through if I'm not going to be able to go through all that um, in depth. Like I'm just trying to give you guys some stuff to research. I want you guys to actually take something away from this talk. Um, continuing. Um, so if you have a, so if you have a constituency parse, right? So you build a binary tree, right? And then you say, okay, now give me the word vectors. So again, the word vectors come from that matrix, that that word embedding. And then what I want to do is I want to I want to use the constituency parse to combine the words. So you have the word embeddings, right? And then you mix and match the word embeddings up the up the parse tree. So let me show let me let me actually show you what that looks like real quick. So this this is what I meant. So you have so rather than doing this moving window, you can actually build a recursive neural network instead. So if you in this case, if you remember if you remember the, the constituency parse I saw you saw earlier, right? You'll notice at the bottom there are those vectors. So those vectors are essentially the the words that you're learning. So you have the words, and then you go up a tree, and then each of those nodes has a likelihood of being a label. You can also do unsupervised learning with this. This is called a recursive autoencoder. So the recursive autoencoder uses these word embeddings, which represent word usage. You then mix and match them. And you, so what you do is you, you learn approximations of the whole sentence based on the, the structure of the constituency parse. So you train a neural network on the constituency parse itself. right? So you can use these embeddings in either a moving window scenario where you, where you, where you train a feed-forward neural network on a static feature matrix. So let's just say if you have Let's just say if you have a, a window size of three, right, and then three words, and then it's a 300, it's a 300 length embedding, you would have 900 features that you use for a window. So in this case, what you can do instead is you can say, okay, now I want to use 300 features for each of these, and then I want to combine these into another 300 length vector, right? So in this case, what you do is you train, a, you actually train a neural network and learn contexts. So you, and then what you can actually do is you can actually go down the tree and get approximations for every context. So this is, this is a way to do sequence learning. You can also use this with long, long short-term memory neural networks as well. Right? So long short-term memory neural networks do not use recurrent, by the way. Do not use backpropagation through time. For those of you who actually like, are doing deep learning, use long short-term memory. Anyways, so long short-term memory neural networks, they learn a sequence. So this is, this, is a, this is what's called a recurrent net. A recurrent net uses something called backpropagation through time. So backpropagation through time is, an extra feed, is an, basically an extra feedback loop, where in this case, you learn context. A long short-term memory neural network solves what, one problem with, with these neural networks, though, of backpropagation through time also has a problem called the vanishing gradient. The vanishing gradient says, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget what I learned 1,000 years ago or hundred, you know, hundred words ago. It's a way to generalize sequences. So you can actually train these neural word embeddings on a long short term memory neural network or a recurrent net. So what does that look like? So in this case, what you can actually do is you train an individual embedding and then you basically build a language model with the embedding. So the language model is a vector, right? And then what you can actually do is you can say, all right, now I want to, I want to, I want to train it on the next word and the next word and the next word. You actually train it on a sequences. So a, recurse, a recurrent net is actually a generative model. So you can actually use these neural word embeddings as a generative model. So in this case, like, what can you do with this? Sentiment analysis. So one way to do it is a recursive neural tensor network, right? 
So recursive neural tensor network essentially solves the same problem that long short-term memory does. I'm going to use the recursive representation just to kind of show you like what a sequence looks like, because it's roughly the same idea. So you train on a sequence, and you learn likelihoods of particular words at particular contexts in, in, rel in relation with each other. So a recursive neural tensor network also uses a binary tree for the representation. Right? So you can use this in vision and all sorts of fun things. You can think of a recurrent net and a recursive net as basically the new, the new condition of random field. Right? So you guys have used max ent models. You guys have probably used like head Markov models. Um, so in this case, like, the, recur the, the recursive net is basically an automatic feature engineering tool um, with, with, like, with, with a built-in weight matrix. So it's just hidden Markov models with a weight matrix, basically. So in this case, you learn, so anyways, you learn varying length sequences. The sequences are based on these word embeddings. And again, word embeddings represent usage. To map this back to deep learning, so if you'll see the, if you, if you look at the bottom there, the, the, the handwriting task there, that's, that's the MNIST data set. Those are learned features from a neural network. So those are actually the weights drawing those, the, the, that handwriting. So that's, that's the automatic feature engineering. So this was drawn from a restrictive Boltzmann machine. A restrictive Boltzmann machine does, is an autoencoder that does automatic feature engineering. WordDevac is also an autoencoder. One you use with text, another one you can use with images or what have you. So you can actually also, like, so, what, so what's the implication here? So while an RBM is related, you, can, you typically do pre-training in a deep belief network. You don't need to do that if you're going to do everything with WordDevec, though. WordDevec does pre-training for you. So if you do WordDevec, you actually can just use backpropagation instead, right? So let, let's, let's keep this in the context of NLP, though. So remember, we have these word embeddings, right? And then you learn varying length sequences. So those words already represent usage, though. So the great thing here is that I've already ran some sort of, I've already ran some sort of preprocessing. So in this case now, I can just use these representations without doing any sort of, I can actually do without any sort of preprocessing. So all you have to do is train a vocab, and then you're done. And then you just, you just go up the tree. So what does this actually look like, though, for, for if I want to do supervised learning? So in this case, remember that each, each context has a label. So in this case, like for, for recursive net, you have a softmax at each node. The softmax represents the likelihood of a particular label. So you, in this case, what you can actually do is use each of those contexts to identify, like, this part's negative, this part's positive. So this allows you to do fine-grained classification with just one sentence. One thing, though, is that these recurs the recursive neural nets can be slower to train. Um, I highly recommend using long short-term memory instead. I mainly use the, re the recursive net as a way of kind of demonstrating what you do with deep learning. So deep learning typically with, uses recursive nets, though, for a lot of NLP. Most recently is when people are starting to use LSTMs now. So again, long short-term memory. So the embeddings are, the, the, automatic, the automatic feature engineering is the key here. So neural networks, vectors, and vectors that represent usage. That's, so what I'll do now, what, the, the talk ends at 11.10, right, I think. So, we only, so I only have a few minutes. So what I'm actually going to do now is, now that I've ran the gamut of, holy crap, that, that's, there's a lot going on here, what I want to do now is take, take the last few minutes for questions and kind of expand on things that might be interesting to people. Again, you guys will get WordDevec all throughout this conference. I wanted to give you guys, I wanted to give you guys a takeaway here. So you guys, you guys are going to see WordDevec again and again if you want to go in depth. I'm more like, how do I build a deep learning app today? So I'll take questions now. Sure. I mean, okay, so have you looked into the paragraph embeddings much? The paragraph embeddings by Kwok Lee? So it's called, do so if you use GenSim, it's called Doctivec. So the paragraph embeddings represent, like, represent document embeddings for, so what it does, Doctivec in this case trains the embeddings on labels. So what you do is you, you, teach, you teach the word vectors labels instead if you want to do document classification. I mean, that being said, another thing you can do, you can use the moving window approach I described. So like you, you do a moving window over the document, and then you do an ensemble. 
And then what you can do is actually, so this generalizes better actually. So you can actually train, you can actually do a moving window. So let's just say you have a word embedding of three, 300 in length, and then three, like a moving window of three, you have 900 length feature vectors, and then you can build a classifier that classifies individual contexts, and then you can, do, you can actually vote instead. So, so, you can also, so you can also do this with, you can also do this with recursive nets as well. Um, there's actually better, there, so there, there's actually starting to be approaches use, using convolutional neural networks as well. So convolutional neural networks are typically used in vision for, in this case, like position and variant features. What you can actually do is you can actually teach it document classification as well by convolving all the, you can actually convolve all the words that occur and then, and then back propagate on the label as well. So what does that look like? So this is a convnet. So what you actually do, in this case, instead of mapping an image, you map, you, map, you, map, you map the word embeddings instead. And then what you do is you actually run a convolution on the out, like all the, on, on, all the, on all the words that occur. And then you can use, and then what, and then what you got there on the, on the final fully connected layer is basically logistic regression. So that's basically logistic regression on the output layer. So you can train, you can actually train a classifier with respect to the, all the words that occur and then like, so you can get a good feature representation there as well. Um, anything you guys want clarified at all? Like, cause I know, like I went, I went quick, uh, go ahead. So I would, I would use, I would use WordNet, I would actually use WordNet senses, uh, in combination with the tokens. So what you can actually do is have each token, each individual token, each individual sense be a vocab word. And then you can just label your corpus per, uh, for your particular domain. Oh, so, oh, okay, so fast convolutions? Is that your question? Okay, so fast convolutions, like, okay, so um, disclosure, I'm, I'm the author of Deep Learning 4J. Um, I, I do a lot of Spark and Scala, so I'm more the JVM, but um, I actually wrote my own scientific runtime uh, in CUDA, like, that uses CUDA. So I actually use Spark with CUDA uh, to, to scale. So I, use, I actually use NVIDIA's uh, fast Fourier transforms and, and convolutions. Uh, for the GPU. So in this case, like in this case, like what I do though is I allow multiple host threads to use multiple GPUs. So that's what I do with most of my customers is they use fast Fourier transforms with multiple GPUs, and then they spread that out across. They they spread the computation out across. But either way, like use use GPUs if you can. So okay, so let me let me just explain one thing there. So convolutions are a very computationally intensive operation typically done on three and four dimensional data. So if you, remember, if you remember, images are like, images are R, G, and B. You have, three, you have, you have multiple channels, right? So you'll notice here that the, conv, the convnet actually, in this case, will, will actually, if you, have a, if, you have, if, you have, if you have n dimensional data, you have the number of, Im, the number of examples by number, by number of, let's just say number of channels, by number of rows and by number of columns, that's four dimensional data. So a, a convnet actually has a multi-dimensional weight matrix that, that's represented by those feature maps there. So it can actually learn all those things. It can actually learn from all those features at once. And it learns position and variant features. This is, this is the most computationally intensive of all the neural networks. Um, so they don't, so convnets have a problem. Uh, convnets can have problems scaling as well. Um, so, you know, like distributed, you know, so like if you're going to do distributed deep learning, uh, like at Google or something, right, you know, and that's, that's what I specialize in is a lot of distributed stuff. Um, I typically use feed, sorry, feed forward neural networks for that because like, you know, it's really hard to, it's really hard to scale out like that convolution operation, which is why most people use GPUs. Um, other questions? All right, um, one thing I'll do then is show, like, show, show a really quick, cool demo. So if I can find it. Um, I think it's, all right. So these were the, these were the word embeddings I mentioned before. So this is this is actually this is actually TSN in action. So in this case, I'm using D3 to visualize the words here. So you can like zoom in. You can see that some words are conceptually closer. 
So like day and a go on the left over there, right? So this is this is a sparsely trained vector, so it might not make sense, but like this is actually a way to debug like how well your word embedding is trained. So one thing I encourage is if you're gonna do deep learning, debug your neural nets visually. So use something open like I'm biased, but I believe I believe you should use something open source, hence why I made my own framework, right? Um, you know, like use something open source and like actually understand what you're doing. Like you know, like you can use a black box, but it's only going to get you so far, right? Debug your stuff visually. So you can do you can do things visually with words, the word embeddings. You can also do things you can also do things like histogram the weights. So typically, like when you're training, you have um, you at each iteration you render the histograms for the gradients as well as the parameters. So and what you can do is if you see those are normally distributed every iteration, you know that's going to converge. You know it's going to converge faster and easier. Um, so debug your neural nets visually. So what's really cool about deep learning is since basically everything's generative for the most part and everything's unsupervised, you can you, it's really hard to evaluate the features, but when you do, like, you get to use really cool stuff like this, this anecdote. Um, so remember, like, the, the intuition here is you're learning word usage. So you want conceptually similar words or phrases to be, simil to, to be close to each other. Oh. Okay, thanks. <laughs>